Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation on principles of antibiotic chemotherapy. Uh, my name is Anne Harab Davis, I'm a professor of medical microbiology and an honorary consultant microbiologist. I'm also vice president for learning at the Royal College of Pathologists. Now on the one hand this is a huge topic and I wasn't able to include everything in one session but I have tried to put together a useful overview. Having said that, on the other hand, in doing this, I have included more content than I normally would in an in-person lecture on the basis that this is recorded. So you can pause for a break when it suits you, or you can watch different parts of the recording at different times. So this is an overview of what we're going to be covering. Uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction. I'm then going to talk about some general principles in choosing an antibiotic. I'll go on to talk about some ex example antibiotic classes that I've selected because of their importance. And I'll talk about the, the spectrum of activity. And then I'm going to go on to talk about antimicrobial stewardship. If you want to uh, pause the lecture uh, at the beginning of the antimicrobial stewardship section, that, that's quite a good place to, to break the session up if you want to do that. So the, the whole concept of antibiotic or antimicrobial chemotherapy, in this case, we're mainly talking about antibiotics, which are active against bacteria, is that there are fundamental differences between human cells and bac bacterial cells. Um, you're probably already aware of these differences, but human cells are eukaryotic, which means that they have the features listed on the left there, whereas bacterial cells are prokaryotic and have the features that are listed on the right. Uh, of particular note, in eukaryotic cells, the DNA is enclosed in a nucleus uh, and is arranged differently from uh, how it is in a bacterial cells. There are differences in the ribosomes and uh, eukaryotic uh, cells in terms of human cells do not have a cell wall, although plants and fungal cells do. Bacteria have DNA which is not enclosed in a nucleus, it's free in the cytoplasm um, and it has a different ribosomes and it has a chemically complex cell wall usually. And I mentioned these features because these are the, these differences are what we exploit when using antibiotics uh, by targeting parts of the bacterial prokaryotic cell that are different from human cells, we're able to target only those cells and relatively uh, not be too toxic to the human cells. And that is the concept of the magic bullet. So I've put a picture of a bullet there to illustrate that. Uh, and this is the reason why uh, in a lot of cases, antibiotics are relatively uh, non-toxic to human cells. Uh, I've listed here some of the common targets found in bacteria. Um, you'll, I'm sure you'll be aware of these. So an important target is the peptidoglycan cell wall. As I said, human cells don't have a cell wall, uh, but bacteria have peptidoglycan walls, which, are in some, which are, have a, a particular structure, and that's what is targeted by the very important beta-lactam group of antibiotics, as well as the glycopeptides like vancomycin and ticoplanin. Uh, other antibiotics target the ribosomes, uh, the DNA coiling and folate synthesis, and I've put examples of different classes of antibiotics against those. So what do we have to bear in mind when we're choosing an antibiotic? Well, there are a lot of factors to make to take account of in this decision. We need to consider the spectrum of activity. OK, so there's no use prescribing an antibiotic for a gram positive infection that is only active against gram negative bacteria. So that's really fundamental. But it's also something that uh, can cause to, to non microbiologists and non infection specialists can cause some confusion. I'm going to discuss that in more detail in a minute. So that that's absolutely fundamental that we pick an antibiotic with the right spectrum of activity. Uh, but there are a lot of other considerations as well. We need to consider whether our agent needs to be given intravenously or orally, and some agents aren't available uh, as an oral preparation. Uh, 
On the other hand, there are a number of antibiotics that achieve blood and tissue concentrations, which are just as good uh, by using them orally. So they have very high bio oral bioavailability, and that includes drugs like ciprofloxacin, which is a quinolone, of course, and metronidazole are good examples of those drugs. Uh, we need to consider whether the chosen antibiotic is going to get into the site of infection. And this is a consideration particularly in hard to reach sites such as osteomyelitis or uh, brain abscesses and meningitis are, are good examples where we have to consider that. Uh, allergies, whether the patient has an allergy to that particular antibiotic. Drug interactions, so some antibiotics interact with certain uh, other drugs. Uh, the side effect profile, uh, as an example, uh, antibiotic associated diarrhea or even a disease with Clostridioides difficile, which I'll touch on again later. Uh, whether the, pre the patient is pregnant or breastfeeding, uh, because there are uh, some antibiotics are contraindicated uh, in, in those situations. The existence of either national or international guidelines or local policies on what is preferred in that situation. Uh, so we always take account of these. Uh, you don't necessarily always have to uh, adhere to them if there's a good reason not to, but you usually ought to, you ought to be able to document a reason why you're not sticking to the locally accepted and nationally accepted guidelines. And all else being equal, uh, you may also be considering the cost of the antibiotic. So if there are two possible options and one of them is cheaper, then of course that's a consideration as well. Just a quick word on bactericidal and bactericidal antibiotics. Now this is also often cited as a consideration in prescribing. Uh, and you may well have already come across this concept previously. The traditional way to present this is that bactericidal antibiotics kill the bacteria and that bacteristatic antibiotics inhibit their growth. Um, actually, there's a more technical definition of what is bactericidal and bactericidal, which I've put there. It's all to do with the ratio of the uh, minimal bactericidal concentration versus the minimal inhibitory concentration. Uh, so, and what that really means is that bacteria, that uh, antibiotics that are considered bacteriostatic, uh, they can kill bacteria, but they need to be at concentrations further above their MICs than bactericidal agents do. And I've listed at the bottom of the slide some examples of bactericidal and bacteristatic antibiotics. Now, conventionally, uh, we uh, consider that we need bactericidal antibiotics in certain situations, which I've listed here. And they include febrile neutropenia, where the patient's own immune system is, is not able to clear up uh, infection if the antibiotic only inhibits the growth of the bacteria. Normally, with a normal immune system, the, uh, the immune system can do the rest of the job, but uh, these patients may not be able to do that. Also, um, meningitis, uh, infective endocarditis and bacteremic sepsis, so, so sort of very serious infections where we want killing of the organisms as quickly as possible. And this, this is what is conventionally uh, considered. However, uh, the, 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 there are some um, caveats to this, and, and this is considered by some to be a somewhat outdated uh, view. If you're interested to read more, uh, I refer you to this paper um, in Clinical Infectious Diseases a, a couple of years ago, um, which uh, did a, a systematic, systematic review of uh, the use of antibiotics in, uh, which were static versus those which were sidal in actual clinical practice. Um, and it found that, uh, they, that randomized controlled trials of high quality were not able to demonstrate superiority of bactericidal over bacteristatic agents. Uh, so the dosing and the pharmacokinetics and the tissue penetration are also important in efficacy. So that's just um, something to think about. Having said that, um, conventionally uh, in, in practice, uh, where, where I am, we do still tend to uh, stick to these principles. So going on to antibiotic spectra, uh, 
Some antibiotics are considered to be broad spectrum in that they cover a wide range of different uh, bacteria and some are narrow spectrum, so more specific. And we always, of course, want to use the narrowest spectrum antibiotic that we can. And we reserve broad spectrum antibiotics for when we really need them. So we don't want to be generating, for example, antibiotic resistance by using uh, broader spectrum agents than we need or uh, risking uh, disrupting the patient's microbiome more, microbiota more than is necessary. And when we're thinking about antibiotic spectra, uh, it's useful to think about whether we want to be treated gram-positive organisms or gram-negative organisms, atypical uh, pneumonia organisms, uh, and anaerobes are some of the organisms. Of course, that list doesn't include every possible bacterial pathogen, but th those are the categories that we, in the first instance, that we tend to consider when we think about antibiotic spectra. And so when we're approaching a, a prescribing decision and considering antibiotic spectra, there are really three steps to the clinical reasoning. We start with the patient always. We do the clinical assessment to decide what we think is the likely source of infection. And usually uh, when we're advising non-infection specialists on the ward or in the clinical setting, uh, this, this is usually not too problematic and people generally are quite confident about number one. Number two is that the prescriber then needs to know what organisms are likely to cause infection in that particular source. And this involves a basic knowledge of microbiology. And this step uh, is sometimes where uh, non-infection practitioners uh, tend to, th their knowledge sometimes lets them down. They may not have, have a very good knowledge of uh, basic clinical microbiology. And then the third step, once you've determined what organisms you think you want to cover, is what antibiotics are needed for those organisms. And we go for narrow spectrum when we can. And that is all about understanding antibiotic spectra. And again, this is where we tend to get lots of calls for advice because steps two and three, people's knowledge are, are is generally sometimes shaky if they're not working in infection. Uh, so I'm going to talk about now step number three. So this table lists some important antibiotic classes. It by no means includes all antibiotics, just some of the ones that are important. The ones that are in dark blue are those that are generally active against gram-positive uh, organisms. The ones that are in red are generally active against gram-negative organisms, although not exclusively. Uh, but uh, I find this useful when I'm teaching uh, junior doctors, uh, and, and I thought that perhaps you might find this useful to show your local non-infection specialists as well. You can see that the beta lactams I've put in green, and that's because that's such a huge class of antibiotics that it's not possible to say, OK, th these all cover gram positives or gram negatives. There's a, a wide range in there and we have to consider them separately so they can't be classified in the same way. I haven't got time today to talk about all these different antibiotics, but I'm going to concentrate on just three important groups, which are the beta lactams the glycopeptides and the aminoglycosides. So on the right here, you can see the beta-lactam ring, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, and all the beta-lactam antibiotics contain this as the, the active part of the molecule. And uh, the way that they differ is that they have different side trains, which give them different uh, clinical, different characteristics in terms of the cover that they provide. Uh, and you can break the beta-lactams down into four groups, the penicillins, the cephalosporins, the monobactams, and the carbapenems. So let's have a look at uh, three of those groups in a little bit more detail. I'm not going to talk about the monobactams anymore because they're not used as commonly as the other three groups. Uh, so I'm going to concentrate on the penicillins, the cephalosporins, and the carbapenems. So uh, it may well be that you're already very familiar with antibiotic spectra, but I'm just going to run through them so that um, everyone is, is up to speed with these. So within the penicillin group are uh, 
a group of antibiotics whose names end in psyllin. So if the name end in psyllin, it's, it's a, probably a penicillin, and they include penicillin, of course, which is a very narrow spectrum agent. It's useful for streptococci like the group A streptococcus. It's also actually active against Neisseria meningitidis, uh, which is the meningococcus causing uh, meningococcal meningitis and sepsis, and treponema pallidum, the bacterium that causes syphilis. We also have flucloxacillin, uh, which is useful for Staph aureus, as long as it's not MRSA. And then we have amoxicillin or ampicillin, which is a slightly broader spectrum penicillin, which gives it some gram negative cover and much better intracoccal cover. And that's useful for respiratory infections. Flucloxacillin, uh, which is also known in, in the US, they use methicillin, which is pretty much interchangeable. Uh, was the first penicillin that was developed in the 1950s through rational drug modification uh, from penicillin. And it was developed specifically in order to treat Staph aureus. And I find that um, in order to understand and to remember antibiotic spectra, actually knowing the history of when these antibiotics were developed and in what order is actually quite helpful. Uh, so by the end of the 50s, they had penicillin and flucloxacillin. And they then introduced some broader spectrum penicillins, such as um, amoxicillin or ampicillin. And this, as I've already said, had uh, some gram positive cover, as well as being uh, covering streptococci and Enterococcus faecalis. And the original intention was that this would be a penicillin that could be used against E. coli. And it was released in Europe in 1964. And by just six months later, already there were ampicillin resistant E. coli uh, evolving, which were first um, found in, in Greece in a patient called Mrs. Temoneira. And therefore, the plasmid that encodes that the, the beta lactamase that, that um, is responsible for destroying ampicillin was coined uh, TEM1. That was the first beta-lactamase that was identified that was active on, on uh, disrupting the action of ampicillin. Of course, we now have many, many more beta-lactamases. Uh, and so this has meant that actually quite a lot of gram negatives like E. coli and other antibacterialis have become resistant to amoxicillin, and it's not really a great option for those organisms anymore, at least uh, in the UK. Uh, we find that around here, uh, around half of our uh, E. coli's in urines are resistant and we can't really use it as first line. But it's still useful for Enterococcus faecalis and it's still useful for streptococci and that's why it's, it's um, a good choice in respiratory infections against streptococcus pneumoniae. One of the next developments was the combination of penicillins with beta-lactamase inhibitors. And the two sort of most established of these are um, coamoxiclav, which is a combination of amoxicillin and clavulanate. And by combining amoxicillin with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, you are able to uh, inhibit the action of beta-lactamases like TEM1 and significantly broaden the spectrum of the drug and therefore uh, Coamoxiclav has activity, good activity against gram positives, gram negatives, and anaerobes. And another uh, option which you may be familiar with is piprocillin and tazobactam. Uh, piprocillin is the penicillin here, and tazobactam is the beta lactamase inhibitor. And this gives you a sort of similar spectrum to uh, coamoxiclav, but a broader cover because it also covers uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So that's, that's the penicillins that are the ones that are really uh, most commonly used. I'm going to move on to the cephalosporins. Now, like many antibiotics, uh, the cephalosporins were uh, discovered being produced by another living organism, in this case, a mold called cephalosporium. Remember that in nature, um, the, the uh, Microorganisms are living in competition with one another for, for their ecological niches and for uh, nutrients. And so often 
different organisms produce different, and that's why they, they lots of them produce antibiotic substances that, that can be useful. And this one was found actually in Sardinian sewage in the 1940s, uh, but it wasn't widely introduced in clinical practice till the 1980s. And these have broad spectrum against gram positive and gram negative, although they have developed rather a reputation for causing uh, C. difficile disease. Uh, there are many, many cephalosporins, and you can recognize those by the fact that they, their names all begin with kef. Um, the, the most commonly used are in generations one to three, and over generations one to three, they generally start to gain gram, more gram-negative activity at the expense of gram-positive activity. So we have first generation, an example is cephalexin. In the second generation, we have kefuroxime. And in the third generation, we have kefataxime and keftazidime. So these, th which have uh, better gram-negative activity, but uh, not so good gram-positive activities compared to the first generation. And you're probably familiar with these antibiotics. Uh, only keftazidime, in these generations, only keftazidime has activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We then have our fourth generation cephalosporins, uh, which have a broader spectrum still, uh, and our fifth generation cephalosporins. So I've, I've listed uh, examples of these here. Um, in, in the UK, at least, we, we don't use these so much. We, we are beginning to use them a little more, but in general, they're, they're not very widely used, but they can be useful. Uh, Limitations in, in the spectra of cephalosporins, they're not good against entrococci, apart from keftaroli. Um, again, most of them lack activity against MRSA. They are not active against extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing organisms, uh, which are usually E. coli and Klebsiella's. Also, if you have organisms containing AMPC, uh, the, 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 they should be avoided because there's a risk of derepressed mutants. It's really outside the remit of this talk to talk about these different mechanisms of antibiotic resistance, um, but those are two uh, important, um, um, important mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance in gram-negative organisms. Uh, they're also not active against anaerobes generally, uh, and in meningitis, only no, they don't all reach high enough levels to, to tr in the CSF. Uh, I've listed some there that do, so keftriaxone, very useful for treating meningitis. Uh, they don't get into the eye very well at all, and uh, as I've already touched on, there's the, we consider them to put the patients at higher risk of C. difficile. Moving on to the carbapenems, as you probably know, these are very broad spectrum antibiotics that um, have very broad gram positive and gram negative cover and anaerobes. And uh, we have become very reliant on them in some clinical settings, uh, at least in the UK, for example, bone marrow transplant and chemotherapy units, uh, where we need to make sure that we're um, overcoming uh, some of those resistant mechanisms that I've uh, alluded to. So very useful, but we're trying to reserve them for when we really need them. And uh, we are now seeing a small number, but, but increasing, a small but increasing number of carbapenemase producing organisms, uh, which is, is uh, jeopardizing uh, the usefulness of carbapenems and is something that we're very concerned about. I'm going to go on to, so that, that's the uh, beta-lactam antibiotics that I said I was going to uh, touch on all of their spectra. Uh, and at the end of this section of the talk, I'm going to show you uh, a convenient way to, um, to remember the spectrum of these different beta-lactam antibiotics. But before I do that, I'm just going to talk briefly about the aminoglycosides and the um, um, vancomycin group, the glycopeptides. So starting with the aminoglycosides, the best known example of an aminoglycoside, of course, is gentamicin, uh, but uh, amikacin is another example. And again, these are the product of another living organism. 
These are on the World Health Organization list of essential medicines. Uh, they're inexpensive. And they are usually used for gram negative uh, infections, although they actually they do have some gram positive activity as well. And we do use them. You might have used them and come across them being used synergistically with beta lactams, for example, in endocarditis. Gentamicin, as I'm sure you know, is uh, relatively toxic for an antibiotic. It's uh, nephrotoxic and ototoxic. And that means that we need to measure the serum levels when people are on gentamicin to avoid to try and avoid uh, that toxicity and make sure that the levels aren't accumulating in the patient. I'm not sure whether you will have come across uh, the concept of concentration dependent versus time dependent killing. So I'm going to explain that uh, now. But the fact that gentamicin does display concentration dependent killing means that once daily dosing is usually preferred. I'm going to explain that now. So time dependent versus concentration dependent dosing is another principle of antibiotic use. What does that mean? Well, a in a time dependent antibiotic, uh, the pharmacokinetics mean that the antibiotic concentration has to be above the MIC to kill the organism. But once you do have levels above the MIC, uh, an even higher level doesn't increase the killing. So there's, there's no point having a massively high level of antibiotic because you, as long as you're above the MIC, that's not going to confer an advantage. And that means that you need to give frequent and moderate uh, doses of antibiotic. And the best example of this is the beta lactams. And if you've ever prescribed um, flucloxacillin or penicillin intravenously, you'll know that they need to be given frequently. So flucloxacillin is usually given four times a day, uh, and as is penicillin or sometimes even six times a day. And that's because of this time dependent uh, profile. That makes them actually, although they're fantastic antibiotics, it's sometimes inconvenient in terms of administration. On the other hand, in con concentration dependent killing, the higher the concentration of the drug, the more bactericidal effect you will have. So if you have a very high level, that's that's advantageous in terms of killing, even above the MIC. So the more you give, the more killing you get. And the other feature of concentration dependent antibiotics is that they continue to be active even when the level falls in, then falls in the patient below the MIC. And that's called the post antibiotic effect. And that's a feature uh, with dosing in aminoglycosides. And what that means is that we actually prefer large and infrequent doses. Uh, and that's why we give gentamicin usually for most indications uh, once daily. So we get, give a large dose that gives us a very high concentration that gives us increased bactericidal effect. But when the level falls below the MIC, we don't immediately need to give more because of this post-antibiotic effect, meaning that it's not necessary to, to immediately give another dose as it is with beta-lactams. Now, one might think that giving a very high dose of gentamicin would, would be a problem and a worry because of the nephrotoxic and ototoxic effects. But actually the uptake into the renal tubular cells and the inner ear hair cells is saturable. So that means that when, once you've reached a certain level, uh, those cells are, the receptors are saturated anyway. And so going up to a higher level, a higher concentration is not going to do any more damage than, than is already happening anyway. Uh, and in fact, if you have constant low levels around the MIC or just above the MIC. In fact, that means that the, the toxicity profile is, it appears to be worse because you have constant saturation of those receptors. So it's actually more beneficial to give a high dose and then uh, hold off and, and rely on the post-antibiotic effect before you need to give another dose. So actually, this once daily dosing is considered preferable in terms of toxicity as well. So that's all I wanted to say about the, the amino glycosides. And I'm now going to go on to the last group that I wanted to uh, talk about, which is the glycopeptides. Uh, the main example being vancomycin, but another example is ticoplanin. Um, and again, the, these are drugs that are uh, 
parentally given. The only oral indication for vancomycin is for treating C, C. diff disease in, in the bowel. It's not absorbed. So it's for any other indication, uh, it can only be given intravenously. And that's the same as for gentamicin. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's a product of streptomyces uh, and it's called vancomycin because of its ability to vanquish uh, most gram positive organisms, including MRSA, which makes it very useful for serious MRSA infections. Now, I said that I was going to show you a, 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 a way of remembering the antibiotic spectra, particularly of the beta-lactams, which is quite confusing and might be useful as well if you're teaching non-infection specialists about antibiotic spectra. And this is called, or I call this the antibiotic wheel. That's a diagram of the antibiotic wheel. And you can see that it's in a circle. And on the left, we have our sort of ordinary gram positive and gram negative bacteria. And on the right, we have some special groups of bacteria which we need to give particular consideration to. So if we want to treat gram positive organisms, and mainly this, the antibiotic wheel is about the beta-lactams, okay? So if we want some beta-lactams for gram-positive organisms, uh, we need to look no further usually than the penicillins. Uh, we can use flucloxacillin for Staph aureus, we can use penicillin for uh, group A streptococcus, and we can use amoxicillin for respiratory infections, uh, for example, with uh, streptococcus pneumoniae. So the penicillins are good for uh, sort of the general uh, not particularly resistant gram-positive organisms. If we want a broader spectrum that covers gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, although they're not active for the organisms on the right-hand side, uh, we can use the cephalosporins. So in general, that's the spectrum act activity of the cephalosporins. Anaerobes are a particular group, which of course we have to consider when we're talking about abdominal sepsis. And anaerobes, uh, as I'm sure you know, can be covered with metronidazole, which covers all the anaerobes and nothing else. So that's quite simple to remember. That, of course, isn't a beta-lactam antibiotic, but it's useful to put into this antibiotic wheel. What about if we want to treat all of the things on the left and the anaerobes? Well, that's where um, coamoxiclav is useful. So remember, that's a combination of amoxicillin with a, a clavulanic acid, which is the beta-lactamase inhibitor, uh, giving it a much broader spectrum than amoxicillin alone. If we want to add in uh, anti-pseudomonal cover, so we want the, that spectrum, but a little bit broader and including pseudomonas, we could use piprocillin tazobactam. The trade name is tazacin. But if we want even broader spectrum cover, including the uh, good cover for the extended spectrum beta-lactamase inhibitors, that's where the carbapenems come in handy. And I've put meropenem here. You can see that none of those have activity against MRSA. If we want a drug that's going to cover all of the gram positives, pretty much, or certainly most of the gram positives, then that's where the glycopeptides are useful, like vancomycin and ticoplanin. And just to finish off this antibiotic wheel with the antibiotics that we've been discussing, if we want really good gram negative cover, uh, that, but which doesn't have any anaerobic cover and not, not really usually used for gram positives, that's where the aminoglycosides come in. So gentamicin and amikacin, uh, obviously the ESBL producing organisms like uh, E. coli, which can be some strains of E. coli and Klebsiella and Pseudomonas, they are gram negative organisms. And so gentamicin is active against those as well. So um, I think that I, I find that uh, quite a useful way to uh, show people in a sort of visual way what the different spectra are. Uh, you also might find this uh, chart useful. You can find this on the website www.antibioticaware.com. This is uh, uh, something that some people find useful to refer to uh, for specific, it's, it's more detailed than the antibiotic wheel and it shows you the specific uh, range of activity of some commonly used antibiotics. Uh, so if you want to uh, see a copy of that, you can go to antibioticaware.com. <laughs>
Right, that concludes the section on antibiotic spectra. Uh, I appreciate that's quite a lot of information. And if you want to pause the recording or come back to it later and consider antimicrobial stewardship uh, later on, then that, this is a good place to do that. So let's go on to talk about antimicrobial stewardship because it's, this is an important part of the principles of uh, use of antibiotics, which is what this talk is, is about. So I'm going to look at antimicrobial stewardship, the what, why and the how. So when we uh, make any antibiotic or any drug prescription at all, when any doctor or any practitioner makes a, a prescription, they are constantly balancing the needs of the patient, the, the likely benefits to the patient against the possible toxicities and side effects. And of course, all drugs have toxicities and side effects. So this is a balance that we're constantly making with every prescription and every time we use a drug. However, when we're using antibiotics, we also have to balance that against the needs of the of the society in general and our future patients in terms of the resistance that might evolve as the result of our prescription. And so this need to also balance our future patients' needs is what makes antibiotic prescribing particularly tricky and difficult and I think is, is a reason why uh, a lot of non-infection specialists do struggle with antibiotic prescribing. There's an awful lot to take into account, quite apart from what we've already covered. As well as the obvious risk that using um, antibiotics, unfortunately, carries a risk of generating antimicrobial resistance, uh, we also need to think about other risks to the patient of prescribing antibiotics, including the risk of Clostridioides difficile disease. Uh, and this is just some data, it's quite old data now, but still relevant, uh, that shows that uh, after an, a hospital started to restrict the use of its antibiotics, that is to have an antimicrobial stewardship program in place, the rates of C. diff came down and there's plenty of other data that supports this as well. This is just one example. In, in the UK, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence uh, it made an evidence summary of the data about Clostridioides, Clostridium difficile, as it was then called. It's now known as Clostridioides difficile infection. Uh, and found that the data was very complex, but that in secondary care, uh, the data showed that the worst drugs for inducing C. diff infection appear to be the cephalosporins and clindamycin. Uh, and in the community, they found that it tended to be the cephalosporins, the quinolones and clindamycin. Another study carried out in Scotland looked at uh, the four Cs, so those drugs that I've just mentioned that were identified by NICE, which are ciprofloxacin, coamoxiclav, clindamycin and cephalosporins, uh, and they found that limiting the use of these uh, through antibiotic stewardship uh, was associated with substantial declines in C. diff infections in Scotland. And so uh, antibiotic stewardship is very importantly about uh, preventing the development of antibiotic resistance, but it's also about um, other adverse effects of antibiotics, such as uh, C. diff infection. The World Health Organization, as uh, you're probably aware, this is a very useful resource uh, online. If, if you haven't seen it, uh, good to go and have a look at this. It's quite a complicated resource, but it's, uh, it's called the Aware Classification of Antibiotics, uh, where they have classified antibiotics into access, watch and reserve. That means uh, the access group, uh, we should feel free to use whenever it's need, whenever they are uh, needed so that they should be our first line antibiotics that we usually go to. Uh, the red an antibiotics in reserve are those that we're really trying to reserve for the most difficult and the most resistant infections. That is quite a useful resource in antibiotic stewardship as well, which you can look at in more detail by downloading it from the site. So I just wanted to mention uh, uh, those, those resources. Uh, some UK guidance, which came out a few years ago, uh, um, 
defined antimicrobial stewardship as a healthcare system wide approach to promoting and monitoring judicious use of antimicrobials to preserve their future effectiveness. Although, um, as I've said, it's not just about that, it's also about um, unwanted effects and dangerous effects of antibiotics. And uh, you can encapsulate the, that right down into a nutshell by saying it's about the right drug, the right dose, at the right time, for the right duration of time. What antibiotic stewardship isn't about is about preventing people that need antibiotics from having them. So we want to be able to identify people who do need to be treated with antibiotics and give them antibiotics quickly so that they can be effective as soon as possible. Uh, so it's not about locking away all the antibiotics, it's about finding ways to use them uh, optimally and wisely. So antibiotic stewardship happens in many settings. It happens in the hospital. It can happen in the laboratory, and I'll give you some examples of that. It happens in the community, and it happens uh, more broadly as well. Um, I'm sure you've come across the One Health uh, concept and initiative, which, which is a way of recognising that uh, human health is inextricably intertwined with animal health and the health of the environment. And nowhere is this more true than in, in the use of antimicrobials, where use of antimicrobials in veterinary medicine and in agriculture it is really, and, and um, the, the, the presence of antibiotics in the environment uh, through um, the proper use of uh, sanitation and public health is all a really important part of the jigsaw and is all also relevant to antimicrobial stewardship. So um, I'm not going to talk more about One Health in this talk. Again, it's outside the remit, but I'm going to look at the other three settings and how it's some examples of how you can employ antibiotic stewardship. So in the clinical laboratory itself, we can do some quite uh, um, effective interventions for antibiotic stewardship. We should be reporting only appropriate antibiotic results from the laboratory. Uh, we may test against a wide range of antibiotics, but we don't have to report them all. And what we usually try to do is to report those that are in the local policy and that are suitable for the infection that we're talking about and with the narrowest spectrum. We don't release broad spectrum antibiotic results where narrow spectrum will do. We don't report irrelevant or unsuitable antibiotics that we don't want people to be using in that particular case. We do report all resistant results though. So if it's a broad spectrum antibiotic, but the organism is resistant, we will report that uh, both to guide treatment and make sure that the, that drug isn't being used and that the doctors know that that's not going to be appropriate and also to raise awareness of local resistance patterns. So the reporting is a good place to start. Uh, this uh, is an abstract from some research uh, from, this is from Canada, which found that um, if, if an antibiotic susceptibility was reported, it was shown on the laboratory report, the physician was three times more likely to use that antibiotic. And this is what we want to avoid. So we only show what we actually want them to use that we think will be effective and that we want them to, to be prescribing in that particular case. Uh, this is also an interesting paper that I came across uh, about uh, comments on the microbiology reports and how just putting a comment to help guide uh, treatment actually helps the clinicians to, to make sensible prescribing choices. And in this case, where there were respiratory samples uh, that were sent that didn't grow MRSA and didn't grow Pseudomonas, uh, actually saying so on the report, saying no MRSA and no Pseudomonas was identified in this culture. Uh, in this study, they found that that prevented clinicians, that tended to, to prevent clinicians from actually uh, escalating treatment or, or continuing treatment against those organisms. So where people were on very broad spectrum antibiotics, perhaps in critical care that were covering those organisms, if they actually reported specifically that they hadn't identified those in the cultures, then clinicians were more likely to de-escalate. So again, another example of how the lab can help with antibiotic stewardship. In the wider hospital, what can we do? 
Well, uh, may well be that your hospital may have an antibiotic policy. It is a useful thing to have. Uh, in our setting, we actually have loaded the antibiotic policies onto an app so that all the clinicians can have the antibiotic policy at the fin their fingertips on this app. And that is a very useful way of making them widely and easily and conveniently available to prescribers. Uh, I, I thought another useful document that you might like to uh, have a read of, this is a Public Health England document um, called Start Smart Then Focus, and this is what we base a lot of our antibiotic stewardship efforts in the hospital on. Um, it, it's, um, uh, it's described as a toolkit for hospitals. Uh, Start Smart uh, is about uh, making clear that when indicated, antibiotics should be started properly, collecting cultures before you give your first dose of antibiotic and ensuring that the results are reviewed, uh, using the guidelines for empirical treatment, but very importantly about documenting the indication in the notes so that people know why the antibiotics were started and putting a review date, usually at 48 hours. So those that's a really important part of Start Smart. And the second bit is then focus, and this is about the 48 hour review. So you start smart and then at 48 hours you go to then focus. And that means that at 48 hours, the antibiotics are routinely reviewed in every patient uh, with a view to either stopping them if, they, if it's been decided that they're actually not needed. Uh, switching to oral wherever possible, uh, de-escalating and uh, cutting down on the spectrum to a narrower spectrum if, if that's appropriate, uh, and uh, with, with an eye to a uh, narrower spectrum for uh, less risk of developing resistance and also lowering the C. diff risk. And of course, if the cultures are negative and there's no longer any evidence of infection in that patient, it may be that at the time of admission, uh, they had to start antibiotics just in case. But now if the cultures are negative, we can stop. IV to oral switch, really important part of antimicrobial stewardship. IV antibiotics carry a risk of bacteremia from the line, a risk of thrombophobitis. Uh, they're time consuming for uh, nursing staff. It's better for the patient. Uh, it's significantly cheaper to use oral antibiotics uh, and the patients can go home sooner. So as soon as the patient is stable, we normally try to switch to oral antibiotics and that can often be done at the 48 hour review. In terms of length of treatment, uh, there's no doubt that historically we've been giving too long courses of antibiotics. This is just one uh, study that showed that uh, an example of, of shorter antibiotic courses being just as effective. So this, this, this particular study looked at pr probability of survival after uh, ventilator associated pneumonia if you gave eight or 15 days of treatment and you can see that there was almost no difference. So uh, very often we can be using shorter antibiotic courses and we should be guided by uh, the evidence that's out there on length of necessary courses of antibiotics. So that covers some of what we do in the hospital. In, in the community or in primary care, there are also important ways that we can improve antibiotic stewardship. Uh, again, we have some guidelines about this in the UK, which you could find online if you want to generally read them. I realise that they're not the guidelines that you need to be using uh, in, in your country, but um, it's, there's some useful background in it. And these guidelines identify two basic types of, of problem in prescribing. One is inappropriate demand and one is inappropriate use and the social norm that it's OK to take antibiotics just in case. And this brings us right back to my first slide, really, about the magic bullet. Antibiotics are a victim of their own success, really. They're, in general, they are not toxic and we have this sort of um, um, societal expectation that we will just get some antibiotics just in case. We would never ever do that with more toxic classes of drugs like for example chemo cancer chemotherapy is so toxic because it has to uh, kill human cancer cells and therefore it also is toxic to, to uh, non-cancerous human cells. 
Um, that's the beauty of antibiotics, the magic bullet principle. But we would never dream of giving cancer chemotherapy just in case, would we? It's unthinkable. So strategies that can be used in the community uh, include communication test strategies, uh, clinical scoring systems. Uh, I'll, I'll describe some examples of some of these shortly. Uh, delayed prescriptions, uh, point of care tests and feedback to practitioners. In terms of communication, uh, a useful way to remember these is the six R's. This is about uh, explaining to the patient why they don't necessarily need an antibiotic. That's if, 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 if that's what the clinician thinks. So reassurance about the infection, explain the reasons why uh, antibiotics aren't normally necessary and the possible side effects, give them some other ways to relieve the problem, uh, such as painkillers, uh, give them a realistic time frame of when they might start to feel better so that they don't um, think that if after a few hours they aren't better, that means they, they now do need an antibiotic. Uh, reinforce that with some written information and repetition and uh, give them a safety net. That's R for rescue, safety netting advice, when to come back or seek further help if they're not improving. So those are the six R's. They've been shown to be very effective. Of course, they are a little bit time consuming, um, so, but they are effective. Clinical scoring systems, these can also be useful. And a good example of effective clinical scoring systems is in sore throat. Of course, most sore throats don't need antibiotics, uh, but those that are uh, streptococcal uh, do. Uh, there are two examples here of clinical scoring systems, the Centaur score system or the fever pain score. Um, and both are, you can have a look at them on here, but they're both scoring systems where you ex examine the patient and take a history and you and do some basic observations such as temperature. And then the patient gets a score and based on that score uh, gives you the decision on whether they need an antibiotic or not with an evidence base. Delayed prescribing, also useful. Um, so this is uh, useful in self usually self-limiting and minor illnesses um, and, and can be reassuring for the patient and also beneficial. Uh, strategies can be that the patient um, recontacts the clinician for a prescription if they're not getting better, that the clinician gives them a post-dated prescription that they can't actually use for another 24 or 48 or 72 hours. So if you're not getting better in, in that period of time, then go and pick up this prescription. They can be told to come back and pick up a prescription from reception if they're not improving, or they can be given the prescription but advised not to have the the antibiotic dispensed unless it becomes necessary. And often patients find this very, very acceptable um, and um, are, are very happy with, with this kind of approach. They don't necessarily want to take an antibiotic, but they want the reassurance that they would be able to get one if things got worse. Point of care testing. So this is, is another way that we can uh, make it easier to avoid prescription where it's not necessary or to make appropriate prescriptions when they are necessary uh, by carrying out point of care tests in the community or in, in, in um, practice settings. And a very good example of a point of care test is are the malaria rapid diagnostic tests, uh, which are now approved by the World Health Organization and have been for some years now. Uh, and in this case, of course, they detect malaria antigens using dye-labeled antibodies and have made it much easier to swiftly distinguish between malarial and non-malarial uh, fevers. So that's one good example of a point of care test. Uh, another example from the UK, which actually isn't widely available in the UK uh, or probably in, in many settings, but it's just another example of, of how point of care tests can be used, uh, mainly so far here as a pilot, uh, is by testing CRP. So there's a picture up there of a, a small CRP machine which could be located in a, a community setting. Um, and the impact trial showed that by using the, these CRP point of care tests to support prescribing decisions, uh, 
if you use that in conjunction with really good communication, so the six R's, you could, you could end up prescribing only a quarter as many antibiotics as you could with, um, sorry, you could prescribe antibiotics in a quarter of cases compared to over two thirds with usual care. Uh, but note that actually using CRP to aid diagnosis was not as good as really good communication using the six things, something like the six R's, but using both together was very effective. Uh, CRP, as, as you know, is an inflammatory marker, which uh, can be used to help differentiate between bacterial and viral infections, CRP being uh, often elevated in in bacterial infection and not normally elevated in viral infections. Um, so this, this is uh, the guidance that has been used in the pilots that we've been doing. If the CRP is less than 20, the patient isn't routinely offered antibiotics. But I, I would say that the CRP testing well, it, it's, it's only in pilots and, and small areas at the moment in the UK. It's just an example of how in the future we may be able to use point of care tests uh, very effectively. But it also shows how communication is more important in that particular example. And lastly, uh, surveillance and feedback. Um, so it is possible to, if you can have a surveillance system of uh, the prescribing practice of different practitioners in your community or even within your hospital, uh, and you feed back to those uh, prescribers how they're doing against the, the, the sort of the local benchmark. So the, this is an example of some uh, practices uh, where the average number of prescriptions it is on the black line and you can see that some practices have much higher uh, prescription rates and it's possible by feeding this back uh, to get practitioners to reflect on why they are using more antibiotics than other practices. Uh, and there may be genuine reasons that different in different areas, there may be different health needs, different levels of chronic disease and so forth. So it's not necessarily that because the practice prescribes more that they're doing something wrong, but it's just something to reflect on and think about. And feeding that back can be quite effective. So I'm coming to the end of this presentation now. Uh, we have considered how to select an appropriate antibiotic for infection. There are many considerations because I've, I've looked at some of those and some of the underlying principles. I've talked quite a bit about antibiotic spectra. And I've also talked about how good antimicrobial stewardship is crucial, not only, although very, very importantly, to prevent development of resistance, but also to avoid uh, too many adverse events. And I've talked about some strategies uh, that can be used in antimicrobial stewardship. I hope that you found uh, the presentation useful. Thank you for your attention. And um, I hope that you find the rest of this series from the Royal College of Pathologists uh, and the Ghana College of Physicians and S Surgeons educational and useful. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>